So Knife of Dreams part two, this book has still been an absolute roller coaster so far. So I'm at the halfway point and we're just before chapter 18 and we've mainly been continuing with Matt's storyline. And one of my earliest predictions has come true. So we now know that the gunpowder from the Illuminators Guild is going to be used as just that gunpowder. Now there's really no end to the damage that can be done from this. It really could even the scale between magical people and non-magical people, at least the first time round when the magical people who can channel aren't expecting the explosions and metal flying through the air to decapitate them and their buildings and all their plans. So, you know, I'm expecting some real big things and the prediction really hasn't come true yet. The prediction was that um, it was like a foretelling that Rand would hold the illuminators in the palm of his hand, something along those lines. And I essentially predicted that I feel like they're gonna use the illuminators uh, secrets as weapons. And that's clearly what's gonna happen. Now, the person who told him the secret, the very last of the guild who's alive, definitely has a vendetta against the Sean Chan. But Matt is gonna marry Tuan, who's head of the Sean Chan. So how on earth would she allow them to use gunpowder against them? Well, let me explain. Well, we now know at this point that the, the play by Suroff, who is a dark friend, is clearly going to be that Tuon is not Tuon, that she is a, a facade, somebody masquerading as Tuon, and there's going to be a kill on sight on her. And that might be what we just saw with the group of people attacking Matt, Tuon, and her bodyguard, and Tom, Tom as well. So I think it's gonna become apparent that Suroff has been turned. Tuan to be able to take the throne is gonna have a lot of obstacles and I'm going to bet that a few of those can be fixed and or solved with some gunpowder. And what can't be solved with gunpowder? It seems to be how we deal with a lot of our modern day world and global issues right now. So we really haven't developed that far. And speaking of Tuan, she really is a box of mysteries. Now, of course, she's been foretold to marry Matt, but I really does do think, sorry, that she has her own agenda as well. Of course she does. She's someone who's very capable and very powerful. And we've been told throughout the, the time that we've known Tuan that we need to be careful of her. You know, she's not just this um, small, petite woman who has had everything in her way her whole life. She has a ton of skills. And boy, do we find out about her ruthless streak. First of all, we see when her and her servant viciously snap the Adem onto the three Aes Sedai um, who were traveling with them and how quickly she plans to take control of them. And that was just shockingly vicious. Now, it seems really vicious because, you know, that's second nature to that civilization. So, you know, from our eyes, it seems extra ruthless. But, you know, regardless of whether that is how your nation does business or not, the speed and agility at which she changed the situation was just amazing. And then we get a very cool scene. Tuan wants to see a help. So her, her servant, Tom and Matt all go to visit what is told to her that is a hell, but really is just, you know, like a semi dodgy tavern. Some gambling is done, some enemies were made and they are attacked in the street. Now, why are they attacked? Well, the obvious answer would be because the Sean Chan have been told about Tuan and someone noticed her. But because of the closeness and proximity between that attack and Perrin's, I'm gonna say it's the Forsaken. But what my point is, is that Tom Marilyn very coolly says, you know, oh, I saw something, but I, I, and maybe I'll just forget it because he clearly knows it's something that the person who he saw do it wants them to not know and therefore he would forget, if that makes any sense. And what I think that is, is I think he saw two on or her servant, but most likely two on channel effectively. But Connor, why are you wasting time? The big news from this storyline is Moiraine's letter. Oh my God. So what do we know from this letter, which was a bombshell by the way. So number one, we do know that Moiraine knew she was going to die before she went down to the docks. And I would guess that is from the questions that she asked when she stepped through the Tarangriel. We also know that she's not dead and that she does need rescuing. So I would guess that she passed into another world um, and you know she's just still alive or another dimension or another universe or another time, but Moiraine is still alive. And it's going to be a rescue mission. And it looks like our lineup is Tom Marilyn, Matt, and Noel slash potentially Jane Fastrider. 
And it said that the rescue mission will almost definitely fail without Matt and they may all get trapped there anyway. And then another bombshell is dropped. We now know where the entrance to the Aelfin and or Eelfin's universe, realm, world, room, matchbox, behind the curtain, window, whatever it is, we now know where it is. And our gang is surely going to head down there to try and rescue Moiraine. Can we just take a moment for how exciting that is? This is probably the most excited for an event that I've been for this entire series because I just feel like it's going to give me so many answers. And something else happened is we were confirmed that the golem is catching up with that storyline with those guys and that gang. Now, what I think is going to happen, my big prediction is they obviously have to get off the road. They have to leave the traveling circus, which I love the circus, by the way. It was very fun. But they have to leave the traveling circus and they have to decide whether they're going to immediately go for the elfin and ilfin. And if it was me, I would do that because then I would get to read about it faster. Or are they going to go and deal with the Sean Chan 2 1 situation? Or are they going to split? Um, I don't know what order they're going to do it in. But with the golem coming after them, I think the golem, it would be very poetic if the golem were to catch up with them as they entered the Elfin slash Ilfin's zone. And the reason why is because the golem was described, if I'm not mistaken, it was a while ago, as being snake-like. And the only thing that can affect it is the fox-like medallion. Now, in all of the other reference points, there's the game of like foxes and snakes, where the foxes and snakes move against each other and work against each other. I guess it's kind of like snakes and ladders, like up and down kind of thing. And there's been a ton of other references. And I'm starting to think that the Elfin and Ilfin maybe they don't maybe they're not like on the same side as each other maybe they're like opposite sides of a coin because if the fox head medallion the fox can burn the snake like golem then wouldn't it be interested if the golem followed them in and there was all the foxes there or if you followed them in and then it was all of the snake like people there i just think it'd be very interesting because i'm starting to think that maybe the golem is an elfin or an eelfin? I don't know. I might be reaching there, but I'm just very excited. So after all of that excitement, we go back to Camelin. And it's easily the most boring storyline that we currently have. So Elaine's there. She's gathering more troops, finally. Um, I think it'd be very simple for there to be spies in any camp. And I think there are spies in every single camp right here. There was something that was quite exciting. So we discovered that uh, Avinda's talent, so to speak, is identifying what Tarangri will do. And Elaine has a huge number of Tarangriel that she was studying. And a few of them got me quite excited, which is strange for the Camelin storyline. The communication devices, there was tons of them. I could definitely imagine all of our gang, the ones that we read from their perspectives, you know, the ones on our side, that we think are on our side. Um, I could imagine them all having those at the final battle. And that way they can coordinate their forces extremely well. It's described that one of them controls a machine. We don't know what kind of machine. That is exciting. Um, I would love to know what that's all about and uh, hopefully we find out. And then finally, there's one that like projects books. It has like thousands of books inside of it, I believe. And that could have some awesome information from times long past for things that there are no longer books for. So I would be interested in that one also. The next thing we get is the hiring of a cut purse and this cut purse has been around for a long time implying they're extremely good at what they do and their job is going to be following the traitor who is in the queen's guard and no one's managed to do this yet everybody has died quite spectacularly because although he's a very angry traitor he is a very adept at what he does and the storyline is quite complicated so we have six factions that are under the command of elaine and then there's six factions that are just kind of like hiding out. Um, they were personally slighted by Elaine's mother and therefore pretty much outright refuse to stand behind Elaine. And then there's the six factions that are assaulting the castle who are clearly not going to be helping Elaine. And now the second faction demanded a truce with the third and for a payment they said yes so that payment might be sent across and it's just very political and that's not a big negative like it it has so much potential still but i would like to see some resolutions come in and i was trying to think about this yesterday like i was trying to puzzle out if i was elaine how would i make this happen how would i get these people to overlook what happened to more gays 
And one solution I could think of is Morgay's, you know, reappears. She comes, she spills the beans, she tells the story, she says sorry. And then she passes the succession onto Elaine, which she already has technically by the words she spoke, in a like outward and legal way. Now, for a lot of the houses, it's probably far too late. They spilled a lot of blood. They would be named as traitors. And I just don't see Morgay's ever like stepping up and coming and do that because she's been a prisoner for so long. She's had so many chances to say who she is and try and extradite herself. So if I was Elaine, how would I fix this? And my grand answer is I don't really know. I'm not too sure how she's gonna get out of this. I think the answer lies with our cut purse. We were made a big deal of meeting this person. And I think what they're gonna do is discover who the Black Arja is in Elaine's camp. I think we're also gonna discover how that group of people are murdering the kin and how they're helping out uh, the leader of the faction who's attacking. And I just think maybe some important things are gonna come out and that will spur Elaine to a victory. So I'm excited for the next scene that we get that involves that cut purse because I'm just praying it pushes that storyline along. So with the big discovery that Moiraine is technically still alive, my question for you from this video is, do you think that deaths in stories are a good thing? Are they necessary, permanent deaths, or are they not? And I wanna tell you my thinking on this. I don't think you have to have deaths for a story to be exciting. However, with a story of this magnitude and this length, really, we haven't had major deaths on our side. And to find out that the only major death that we have has have had, sorry, which was Moiraine, which I think was spectacularly done, by the way, actually wasn't a death and they're still around. I don't think it takes away from the story. I think Robert Jordan has built a masterful story and there's so much that I don't know yet. So I don't want to pass judgment. But I do think that overall, having some deaths of main characters raises the stakes of a story. Because right now, we have three characters that it just seems like are never going to die because they're Tavaren. Um, so their plot armor is thick. And just because we haven't seen any of our main characters be killed, not even characters like Galad or Gawain, who are like, are they main characters? Yes, but no. It just means that whenever our heroes are in peril, it doesn't make it not an exciting storyline for me, but it kind of gets rid of the option of they might die. Now, I'm assuming that all changes, especially in the final battle. Like, there's no way everyone gets through that. But, yeah, those are my thoughts. I just feel like, you know, some well-placed, carefully thought-out deaths of, you know, a main character or two really raises the stakes for me as the reader because I now know that all possibilities are on the table. Now, what Robert Jordan has done, though, is he does have some things worse than death. There's a lot of slavery um, with regards to like people being controlled under compulsion and different things that the Dark One does as well. Uh, there's a lot of torture. There's a lot of quite sadistic torture as well, like in a, in a sexual manner. So, you know, arguably that is worse than death, to be fair. And that's happened to a few of our characters as well. But yeah, I think a lot of time death does raise the stakes. But you tell me, what are your thoughts? Outside of that, this book has been amazing so far. The next perspective I jump into is Rand's and um, I'll see you at the next video. Please like and subscribe.